Okay, it's me again, uh, Jean-Louis. I'm an uh, IT professional, uh, mainly in um, ICT management. Um, this is the second video on sort of, yeah, the management aspects really of uh, technology. Um, it serves the same purpose. Um, I'm in between jobs right now and often I have like recruiters um, from HR or higher level management asking me, you know, very pointed questions on well, should we be doing this or should we be doing that where, um, you know, I tend to get into the weeds and uh, and that's not good. Um, what you should be doing uh, really depends very much on um, the maturity of your organization and an awareness of, uh, of where you are right now and what you can build on and, and why uh, you want to do things and, and, and what are critical success factors uh, in uh, you know, doing what you finally decided to do. Um, I ended, uh, or sort of in the middle, I talked about, um, you know, basically, uh, yeah, I said that uh, things have not become easier. Uh, I'm 30 years sort of looking and uh, and working in this triangle between project management and, and technology and, and finance also. And, uh, you know, building and delivering modern applications is... Uh, is hard. Uh, you know, <laughs> applications have become complex, uh, distributed. Um, the technology stacks are, are continually changing, changing. Sorry, and um, yeah, it remains tough. Uh, I'm quoting here really from uh, you know a guy I admire very much, uh, kind of a young uh, IT guru, Maurizio Salatino. Uh, but yeah, he agrees. Uh, you know, he's uh, he, he's one of these drivers of um, in transformation, bringing you know uh, monolithic applications legacy towards this new uh, microservices platform on uh, Docker and um, um, uh, Kubernetes, but um, but yeah, he agrees with it. I think fundamentally, uh, and so I'm going to talk for an hour here because, you know, that that's what I'm going to do. Um, next time when a recruiter or a manager asks me, what do you think about this? I will say like, you know, I've got two videos uh, and this is the second one. And um, and have a look at, um, at uh, what I present there. Um, I think one of the uh, uh, fundamental things when you, when you're an ICT manager um, in operations or you know in, um, in 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 software factory, you know, a development team, or you're in architecture office, or or you think about cybersecurity, or you think about you know maybe certification, uh, ISO certification, quality management, uh, and, and and other uh, ISO standards you 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 may want to adopt is that um, you know there's fundamentally two views on on organization and also on an ICT. Uh, organization the one is that you need to uh, and you need to combine them one is a process view uh, I find the uh, ITIL or ITIL uh, framework um, very useful for that uh, this is a picture of a uh, ITIL version 3 which I find simpler than ITIL version 4 um, basically focused on functions or processes um, as they are called in ITIL version 4 they're, they're called uh, management practices but uh, they've expanded a lot uh, the, the key thing is that uh, these are permanent functions that you want to improve. You want to have um, better incident management, better problem management by, you know, doing indeed a root cause analysis um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, fixing known errors. Um, and often fixing known errors is, is not easy because, you know, your architecture has become very complicated and Sometimes their root causes um, cannot, uh, you know, directly be um, addressed. Uh, request fulfillment, you know, we want to be quicker in, um, you know, a new employee needs his stuff, a computer, um, his iPhone or, you know, another phone. Um, you know, he needs to be equipped. Uh, he needs to get to know the organization. So we want to be quicker at that. Um, and there's a lot of other functions. The thing is that, um, you know, usually, and this is something you need to be aware of, um, these will be supported by very different tools than, you know, you will look at when you have more like of a project-based view on, on your IT organization. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just um, giving some logos there. Like you have these issue management systems service now for me, uh, which which can also, you know, these are great tools. Uh, I think they uh, they also have an, an IT asset management uh, facility you can use. Um, they they're great to track the workflow in you know resolving incidents, um, um, you know assigning problems, and uh, yeah, just uh, what is not an incident, not a problem, just. Um, you know, uh, dealing with, with requests, with stuff that needs to happen. 
Um, for event management, what's happening? You've got monitoring tools. Um, I put the Grafana as a dashboarding tool, uh, which may connect to you know Ichinga on your data center or Victoria Metrics for for what you do in the cloud. Um, you will have your virtualization uh, architecture, VMware, or indeed you know Kubernetes or um, or Citrix. Um, you will have your uh, your stacks, uh, .NET or Oracle, um, and and a lot of other stuff. Um, it's a different picture when you look at, uh, you know, projects, uh, software uh, development. Um, there you're going to have, you know, preferably integrated development environments. Um, you're indeed going to work with Visual Studio or, you know, the, the, the Go, Google ecosystem, um, open source uh, environments um, uh, and frameworks, uh, which you can find on GitHub. Uh, um, etc etc and um, they are related by um, you know key functions and processes indeed in the in an ITIL uh, service um, um, oriented uh, architecture or uh, service management environment you know you need to manage your deployment pipeline you need to manage your environment um, releases uh, version control uh, configurations, um, configuration changes across environments, you know, uh, these environments may be, you know, tests uh, in the various stages in test, units test, integration tests, business acceptance tests, and then your incident and problem management. Um, so the project-driven approach, um, I'm not going to repeat what I said in the last one. I said it's very, very important that, uh, you know, you are, people often talk negatively about legacy. I don't. Uh, legacy is what you have. Um, legacy is what what works. Uh, otherwise, uh, you would have switched it off. Um, and you have your new developments. Uh, if you don't watch out, your new developments will be your legacy of tomorrow in a negative sense, you know, some kind of black box. Um uh, which which uh, which you are not able to to sort of make it move towards you know the next the next big thing or the the, the technology upgrade you need to do. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but you know, uh, yeah, make sure that you have a good portfolio classification for all of your projects, those relating to your legacy systems. Uh, if you're gonna uh, and and distinguish between investment costs and recurrent costs. Uh, I give a few examples there. Legacy, yeah, legacy needs to move. Uh, and maybe you're gonna have. Have a, 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 an upgrade, a, a middleware investment. Um, maybe you're going to refactor it. Maybe you need to address performance issues. Uh, maybe you need to build a top. Uh, you know, users want applications now, so maybe you need to um, build a different front end on your legacy system. And you will have recurrent costs uh, that usually are, are lower, um, or should become lower and lower for legacy systems because you can move. To, Move to you know uh, general public licenses for your software, uh, technology upgrades because it's a known platform. You will have more uh, suppliers. While for new developments, uh, you know you need to be aware of uh, the, the risk of uh, you know besides the investment cost in the longer run, um, you know how how is the vendor scene going to look like? The risk of a vendor lock-in is very real. Um, technology upgrades may be more expensive, um, etc. So um, that's basically the, the, the context for what I'm going to present now down to specifics. Uh, what is it that we manage? What, what kind of systems? And, and why have things become um, perhaps, well, surely uh, more complicated? Here I'm going to experiment with my uh, whiteboard. Um, um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's something I am trying out, you know, instead of um, PowerPoint, uh, a whiteboard, um, so I can highlight things. Um, I would say all of us, uh, I'm 54, we, we all sort of grew up, I think, with a very uh, a classical view on, um, on applications, on systems, and I would trace it back to... Um, you know, the 1990s uh, or even 1980s, where we thought about... Uh, uh, you know, automating things, but automating the automation already and, uh, you know, information engineering, computer-aided software engineering, uh, these kind of things. I think the paradigm was then, um, you know, very much um, procedural, uh, uh, procedural languages that basically, um, you know, uh, um, access uh, data. 
Uh, um, so they're there in, in all these tools that we had at the time, or uh, I mean, I worked on the information engineering facility, which, which moved. Uh, the idea was basically you would build a data model, uh, an entity relationship diagram, or, or whatever you want to call it, a logical uh, data model uh, of all the data in your end, in your company. And then you would have like a four generation language, um, which was pioneered by James Martin in 1981. It was the first time when he mentioned four, four generation languages. We'd would be readable to the user, uh, which the user, uh, you know, could could um, uh, yeah, he he could use that to program stuff himself. It's pretty much the idea that you now have in low code platforms, um, uh, Oracle Apex, um, Out Systems, um, Mendix. Um, basically model your data uh, and you know you can do a, a bit of interface design using forms you know um, I put Google forms there and, and Microsoft forms who are still active or um, you know we had Oracle forms um, and Oracle designer which is now part of fusion middleware it's the same thing you know you have basically your uh, sort of a table view like names and MS access uh, what is your database uh, you design some forms and, and reports, and then you generate the whole thing, and uh, and that's pretty much um, what is still valid for uh, you know your data driven applications. Uh, the key issues I think in that uh, are you know what um, uh, but these have been solved. How do you deal with very large objects? And then large, I really mean um, you know megabyte uh, object like documents or images that you want to attach to a, a data record. And uh, and the other issue really is that. That, um, you know for that stuff uh, in order to to make it work you you really assumed that the data structure would be stable um, if the relationship between you know tables um, between your data objects would, would fundamentally change um, if you wanted to add data objects uh, in in your um, you know to your data model then um, you know it took um, it took a lot of work to sort of link um, you know your data objects back to uh, you know your your procedural code, uh, even if it was a high level code. Um, I'm gonna give a very practical example of of um, of that actually. Uh, one I encountered in a previous organization um, where they have been struggling already more than five years with a with a, with a very basic. Um, uh, thing that, that was that wasn't as stable as they thought it would be and um it's the um you know um uh, the organization managed a lot of uh, uh, records of uh, people who were looking for jobs or had a job or um you know had enrolled for uh, you know publicly financed uh, education or training so to to make them more employable on the, on the job market and so um the um the the, the personal uh, data associated with these uh, people um came from the national register uh, and so one of them is uh, an address now in 2006 there has been uh, an update uh, i'm going to show that here um, in 2016, a simple object in the National Register where, um, you know, the fields uh, changed a little bit. Like for an address, basically, we had a, uh, not one number, uh, the street number, but also a, a sub address, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, was was an extra code. Um, you, you see it. And then a lot of stuff, you know, well, a lot of stuff, you see it here underlined in red. Uh, things that came out a bit of... Uh, not the national register, but um, let's say the administration who deals with the uh, uh, land titling, land registration, so that um, you know the address would indeed link up to a code, and um, that is used in basically you know um, for for property tax uh, reasons. Now um, everybody thought this would be done uh, and implemented throughout uh, all uh, regional. Um, administrations in Belgium, you know, in Flanders, in Brussels, Wallonia, I'm putting that there. Um, so the address database was changed and, you know, there's a web service, you can download it and um, and then you can do whatever you want. Now, the, the thing is that uh, that administration had been already, we're 2023 now, and they still don't have a clue about, uh, you know, how should we go about this? We we use this address, um, you know, in many uh, the interfaces with, with our, with our uh, application and um, and sort of uh, we don't have a clue of sort of where and how this um, change of just a few data fields uh, really impact 
um, the data objects that we are working with, uh, with in in uh, in our uh, in our architecture. And um, I could give other examples. Uh, you know, the um, for for each area, uh, like um, you know, we will be using probably or we will want to use um, a geospatial data. Huh? Or, uh, to, to link it to a map and all these kind of things and for all these things there are standards uh, I'm quoting here the ISO uh, standard for um, the metadata basically for uh, digital geospatial data and these standards evolve and uh, and often we um, you know we need to adapt and uh, and so data structures um, aren't uh, aren't very stable over time yes in the, in the short run they are but over time you know the data model your logical data model uh, even the very 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 um, stable uh, data that you think uh, you, you are building your applications on, uh, forms dancing on a database, um, they will change gradually. So change is needed. Um, and, and there you need to consider uh, what, what is more important, really moving all my code from uh, Java, let's say, to... Um, uh, you know, uh, low-code platform, rewriting everything. Um, is that more important? I think it's more important indeed to, you know, to, to think constantly about being compliant with what I call uh, the big data ecosystem. Uh, again, turning to that example of... Um, of um, of a previous employer, uh, they were thinking about data warehousing, and because they were active on on the market for job seekers and and companies who had vacancies, um, you know, they wanted to do data warehousing, and um, and yes, uh, I asked them, um, so you're going to do data warehousing? Um, what are you going to be your your data pro products that you you might want to offer to LinkedIn, and how you you know you probably want to share and and link up with something like LinkedIn. Uh, they have four or five million um, uh, records, I would say, of, of people or, or members. So um, I, I got a blank stare. Um, LinkedIn has been working for five six years on on you know what what is now called the Data Hub project, which is kind of like. Um, uh, yeah, metadata for for that segment for that sector. Um, you know, em employee uh, or you know um, the career. Or how do you document it? The competences of of people who who have a job or are looking for a job. And um, that data hub project was formerly called um, uh, Warehouse. Uh, you can see there where. A house, uh, but the way you pronounce it is is actually a warehouse, a data warehouse, and so um, yeah, I got a bit of a blank stare. But but these are the important things that you keep track of. Uh, you know what happens uh, in your in your sector uh, around. You know how is metadata being structured? Um, security is probably more more important than. Um, so we think, oh, we we still have a you know mainframe running COBOL. Um, it's not safe. Well, COBOL is safe. Um, COBOL is still, you know, supported. There's a COBOL 2023 standard out. Um, yeah, there's a scarcity of, um, of COBOL programmers and after, you know, 2000 scare. Um, but, you know, um, I quote here a few uh, figures. There's, there's still, uh, and it keeps growing, 800 plus billion lines of code uh, used in, uh, you know, when you, when you sweep your card in an ATM um, at some point in time. Uh, um, you know, you get going, gonna get money out, and and some COBOL code, and ninety five percent of the cases, uh, COBOL code is going to be executed to um, you know um, give you that money out of the machine. It's over three trillion, three trillion uh, dollar uh, in commerce every day. So um, change is needed, but I think you really need to um, uh, be driven by by these things. Um, yeah, compliance. Uh, uh, everything is about compliance now. Make sure that you're ready for the future. Uh, security and and most important, what your users uh, want. Um, and that's where um, maybe I'm gonna make a quick jump to uh, users. Um, yeah, user wants applications, right? Um, they want apps now. Um, people often think, you know, that there's a, that's kind of difficult. You know, building an application it requires us to to change the whole backend. Um, no, um, if you've been comfortable, I would say with .NET uh, and Visual Studio, well, explore it now. .NET eight. Uh, and, and seven already, um, you know, you can build applications for Android or iOS, uh, the XAML uh, environment, um, you can still, uh, 
gives you C++ or C Sharp code. Um, you know, it works. Um, so your front end, uh, you can rebuild it without uh, too much change often to your back end. Start from where you are. Um, users want speed and security, of course. Um, well, that's again where I say you don't get necessarily better speed by merely you know repackaging your applications uh, previous organization oh we we have to do docker and kubernetes uh, we we have to do containers uh, um, so well you end up with um basically repackaging your old um, your old modules and and, and java packages uh, um, in into containers and uh, you know your your application architecture stays the same and um yeah, maybe containers are a bit more stable. I'm really impressed about how Docker and Kubernetes, when there's an error, sort of try to, uh, you know, get a an older version of the container aligned. So, the, yeah, there's stuff there that is nice, but you will not necessarily, you know, get better speed by just um, um, doing, uh, implementing the same application structure into, you know, um, onto a, a new platform. So um, if you're going to go for these things, think of uh, refactoring your applications. Um, and really about those features of the new platform that are built to uh, optimize speed. And I'm thinking here a language I'm very impressed uh, with, uh, uh, Go, uh, uh, with its concurrency fetchers, uh, uh, routines and channels. Uh, uh, it brings it uh, to, to the programmer level where he needs to think about, you know, what can run in background, um, how are we going to do event management uh, uh, when something runs in background, it's finished, you know, how, how is my application going to be aware about that? Uh, so the event-driven um, architectures. And then the security, yeah, I said the first thing is respect for standards. And then I'm not only talking like, uh, you know, I'm talking the big standards, multi-factor authentication, make that a priority. Um, again, you know, this framework, Angular, we should replace it by Angular JavaScript. Um, well, yeah, um, multi-factor authentication, make a firm decision on that. Uh, that that would be an important project. Think about, um, yeah, network segmentation. And of segregation, really isolating maybe uh, a, a certain application, combined with next generation firewalls, not only web application firewall and uh, again a previous organization to try to implement one. There were a lot of hurdles, and in the end, you know, the the project sort of died. Uh, uh, it's not working. Well, you can't let it die. Um, Adopt managed uh, frameworks rather than um, you know I'm thinking like Kafka uh, and we want to do uh, we want to have a framework for event management. I'll come back with that. Make sure it's properly um, supported and that uh, you're using managed Kafka uh, and and standards uh, and that you adopt templates. Uh, monitoring of your systems and most important of all, uh, I would say for secure social engineering and uh, the reverse sense and make everybody aware that you know despite all uh, technology uh, measures that we take. Uh, phishing, uh, an employee who leaks um, his um, his authentication um, to uh, to a bad guy, you know, that that's the, that's the real risk. Okay, let me go back to the um, thing I started with. So a lot of our uh, applications, I would say, um, are database driven applications and so we apply logic to data objects um, and we are really thinking here of you know database records uh, uh, and logic it will be tuples and you know they will have an identifier and so there's a bit of um, history and talking about legacy uh, it's kind of funny uh, you see what was around or was started 30 years ago uh, it's still around but there have been fundamental new things and I'm going to talk a bit uh, about that now uh, in terms of the history you know uh, Sybase uh, you know SAP it runs basically on, on, on Sybase as a relational database so that's still around it's from 1987 uh, Sybase also inspired or helped to inspire uh, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, uh, which has a very significant part of the market, originally on OS2 together with IBM and then, you know, exclusively for the Windows NT platform of Microsoft. Uh, IBM DB2, uh, the relational database system that succeeded uh, IBM's uh, hierarchical uh, IMS. Um, DB2 is still around, like, just like COBOL is still around, the mainframes are still around, and they still need to be serviced. Um, 
Oracle database in 1983, uh, uh, I would say the, the third version indeed, which, uh, you know, they, they really had a, a lead in the market there in terms of, you know, concurrency control, data distribution, and scalability speed. Uh, that advantage has, has waned over, um, I think, the last 10, 20 years, but they, they definitely, uh, Oracle had that um had that performance and and many companies adopted uh, you know oracle database um at same time from 95 i think you had a bit of a reaction against these uh, proprietary uh, platforms and, and their cost so you had mysql uh, which started as an open source uh, uh, relational database um after yeah about 10 years it was acquired by sun oracle we all know that my was the daughter of the um i forgot his name now swedish guy um when uh, sun oracle bought it as sort of well uh, not an alternative to oracle database but as sort of well an open source alternative to their proprietary software um there was a forking of mysql and we have now uh, maria db which is the my was the name of the oldest daughter of that developer maria is the name of the youngest daughter of that developer and that led sort of um you know the m from mysql in uh, windows um, apache uh, mysql and then Perl php stack uh, for for um, client server applications or web based uh, browser based applications or the linux uh, with the same components apache um, mysql Perl php or uh, samp um, or windows um, um, with, with Postgres, the, the P stands for Postgres SQL, uh, which also developed. Um, that's now XAMPP, XAMPP, uh, but you see it all has a history and that's sort of where when you go, things have become more complicated. Yes, but at the same time, you know, if you keep a bit track of, uh, you know, where things come from, uh, the world today is not that much different, uh, at least not in, in, in this realm of... Um, applications i would say data driven applications um said so this is the ranking today december 2023 oracle mysql ms sql server um they're the top three uh, competing with each other um if you add to my uh, sql server uh, you know access and azure uh, sql database uh, then microsoft is is now leading over oracle um postgres sql uh, very popular and then you know lower end ranking sap still and i said db2 what is really interesting to see and there i come to um uh, the need for um you know uh, new applications which uh, and this is the thing that happened over the last 23 i would say more object uh, oriented uh, or or event driven applications and i'm going to talk about that uh, what are what are objects you know you you really get this bland uh, explanation well think of a car uh, and a car has a has a method uh, you can push the uh, the uh, and, and then the car will drive faster or you can brake uh, I, I think these are really bland examples and so I'll, I'll try to give a few better ones of why you know object orientation uh, sort of emerged on the scene uh, because we had to program uh, different objects uh, objects that weren't uh, that had a data structure but weren't data objects um, I will talk about it in a moment uh, I wanted to say that it's really interesting indeed to see that um, well it's linked to the well, we have now um, very different database models MongoDB is uh, is really addressing uh, that issue of you know how, how do we deal with documents uh, we can think of forms and very structured data but you know uh, in, in real life also we, we don't only deal with with forms but more generally in documents and that's sort of semi-structured data uh, and uh, and there you have applications who are um, who have a different model than than a relational one who can also do relational uh, uh, but mongodb is sort of an example of that so-called uh, nosql database which um, which i prefer to interpret as um, no sequel no, not only sequel um redis is a uh, memory databases uh, performance um elastic search search engines uh, you know these are um, referred to as databases but you can clearly see they have a lot more functionality than you know running um you know embedding uh, some sql into uh, you know procedural logic and then running it on on a very classical type of database so um uh, this is the thing uh, in 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 when we when we program and now we move in the world of uh, you know the internet of things there there's a lot of stuff uh, uh objects that um, you know you will deal or or program um very differently 
um, graphic objects um, used in games, but also in art. Um, you know, the automation of your of, of an industrial environment, um, and, and and don't think too far. Devices that now link to your computer, you know, printers and, and other stuff, uh, card readers. Um, how how do you program these devices? Are objects, um, and you're gonna program them, and you can clearly see, yeah, they, okay, there's some data, but it's like, you know, the you're not gonna do assembly language or machine language. Um, you want to really deal with a device, and a device indeed an object where you can say, yeah, they, it has methods, and we need to call these methods, print something, or machines, uh, CNC machines. We have sensors. Uh, sensors, tactile, light, pressure, uh, electromechanical, bio, biochemical, uh, flow, forces that uh, you know think of managing a fleet of vehicles uh, with location data. So there's a lot of events coming in. This is the other thing um, that that are not linked to you know uh, human beings uh, using um, a program or an interface or, or browsing on the web and and and, and filling up a form. Um, now you have that Internet of Things that has emerged, and that leads to you know events. Uh, combined with that sort of idea that we also need to work with semi-structured data, um, such as documents, um, and also I would call it, uh, well, there has been a lot of order in, into the field of semi-structured data with the HTML uh, document object model. Uh, I can talk about that, but I, uh, then my presentation would probably last too long. Um, but you will have um, new databases, multi-model databases, as they are called, which can uh, also handle that. You know, documents, graph databases, vector databases, um, spatial databases on top of the relational stuff. Um, I'm going to the, um, yeah, this thing, uh, I, I repeat really, if you have an application which, which follows that model where, you know, you have a database uh, and, and, and basically the user interface is about, you know, forms, very structured data, and then your, your classical logic, then, you know, it, it will work fine. Uh, you can have embedded, uh, SQL in, in, in COBOL or in C or uh, in, in, in languages that, that depend on them and, uh, it will work fine and uh, it will be easy to maintain and there's perhaps no need to go to you know the next new um, the next new platform um i talked about this uh, how data can change well again here may be um examples of uh, you know objects that are um, that don't resemble, you know, data objects, data records, graphical objects. Uh, I played around 30 years ago with uh, the very first, um, you know, Commodore 64 and Atari, uh, these game computers where we could program games um, uh, by programming graphic objects. And these graphic objects uh, in the Commodore 64 environment were called sprites. And they were, yeah, movable object blocks, uh, quite light and figures, and we could uh, make them move on the screen. Um, we uh, they, they they weren't controlled by the the CPU, but by a, a, a special um, well a chip and a chipset around it. Uh, the, the 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 video interface controller, VIC two as it was called, uh, built on a MOS chip, and um, you know it was, it was fun. It was a um, sort of programming using basic and then you know what what resembled a bit um, uh, assembly language because in the the, the, the vic uh, chip had i think like 57 uh, registers um so we we made nice video games um multi multiplayer and uh, you know the connection uh, which was then a you know, telephone connection uh, um an analog connection was very slow but yeah we could play games like chess um with, with other people far away um that has evolved of course games today are like um you know i'm not a gamer uh, but i looked at sort of uh you know the top games um and they how many uses they have minecraft which is number two or three i think um we have these war games also uh where you sort of as a user you have an avatar and you walk around in a virtual world um it has over one million of simultaneous uh, online players, one million users at the same time, 
you know, steering their avatar around in this virtual world, and there's a lot of events, and you know, they fight with other avatars or they kill, try to kill other avatars, and um, so the sprite has become an avatar in these online games, and I cannot imagine the the complexity of um, how how you how you would program these things, but I same time I can a little bit because yeah, that experience from the sprite, how you control it, how you yeah, basically program some some motion uh, and, and other methods that you want to you know you want your sprite to go here in a linear path or non-linear path etc um, so yeah for game development um, you will use um, yeah languages and, and a whole other um, I would say a development environment than for you know a database driven uh, application um, game engines uh, I looked at it Unity a little bit uh, because I I, um, I did a certification in Python. Unity does a lot with a, um, um, uh, imaginary numbers, which I like. I like math. Uh, Unreal Engine and these are languages like C plus plus, C sharp, Python. Uh, Java is much uh, much less mentioned there. Um, so um yeah with games also i said there's a lot of stuff happening in such a virtual game so i would like to link it here to you know uh, not so classical programming like um yeah we need there's a lot of events and and so a lot of the logic that gets executed is going to be driven by events and so um uh, that's a whole different concept than you know the, what we know user interactions uh, html events on click do this uh, on drag uh, do that on change uh, of a button uh, do this uh, so, so that's what we're used to but these are like uh, sensor events or a whole a whole different kind of uh, events again there you don't need to reinvent the wheel um, um, I, I, I looked a little bit uh, you know what can I do on my Windows laptop um, well you can actually uh, there's a, a sensors uh, API on in Windows and uh, I found out that uh, you can actually connect a lot of sensors to your Windows um, platform and uh, and see uh, what happens to them and use them as input. Um, the other area, as I said, that has um, um, uh, taken on a lot of importance, the Industrial Revolution uh, 3.0, I would call it. Uh, 2.0 was uh, petrochemical things and stuff. Uh, 3.0 was automation. 4.0, the CNC machines, uh, computer uh, numerically controlled machines with um, industrial control systems, uh, supervisory and control, uh, I forgot for what SCADA stands for, uh, PLCs, program, uh, lo uh, logical controllers, uh, programmable, sorry, programmable uh, logic controllers, uh, sensor networks, and that drive, um, you know, I would say not the Internet of Things, but, uh, you know, yeah, machines like drills, uh, lathes, mills, uh, grinders, routers, um, uh, routers and physical routers of stuff, uh, 3D printers, um, or more simple, think about, uh, you know, device drivers. There's a lot more devices now, and um, yeah, these device drivers will be programmed in a very different language than uh, the language you would use for, um, um, you know, uh, programming uh, logic that uh, basically is uh, based on uh, CRUD, create, read, um, uh, delete uh, or update uh, a record in your database or uh, you know maybe with an extension um, uh, procedures on, on your database. So um, YC or C++ apparently for device drivers um, I'm certified in language but it's true that unlike Java um, it, 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 it does give access to uh, you know lower level instructions um, and especially if you would um, download um, uh, driver development kits um, for them. Um, yeah, CNC machines, we know there's G-code, M-code, which resembles very much uh, assembly language and were really instructions at, at the level of the machine. Um, but so that's what uh, object and event-driven um, uh, logic is all about, uh, for me at least. Uh, you can see, um, yeah, it requires a different approach, and therefore you have that evolution towards, you know, languages that are fit for purpose. Um, users, this is maybe um, uh, my last uh, slide. Uh, well, I have another one here. Yeah, yeah, maybe this one um, on on data. Um, just to reinforce that point, um, 
I, I worked a lot actually on public financial management in um, in foreign countries, Afghanistan, Nepal. Uh, I just came back from a trip to East Timor. And uh, I looked there at PFM systems, you know, with the Ministry of Finance. What are you using uh, for budgeting, for budget execution? Uh, and then budget evaluation uh, for for multi-annual planning, etc. And I'm amazed uh, about the lack of um, um, awareness uh, about what a chart of accounts uh, really is. A chart of accounts is basically a very complicated uh, data structure. While well, very complicated, it's organized in multiple tiers. Huh? We have an organization classification usually at different levels. Huh? An organization, a ministry with a sub-organization, uh, a director general, and then uh, you know organizational units below it. And that um, you know these are going to be active in a certain sector, uh, the, the, the GFS sector it's often called, and uh, general classification of um, uh, sectors, um, that's an IMF uh, standard, you know, education or um, uh, infrastructure, and that's going to have subsectors, so you, you, you need to link it up, uh, your organization, your sub-organization, say like, okay, we're active in this sector, and, and so that's where you can compare, um, you know, the... Uh, the, the the accounts the public sector accounts of one country with, with another one say well they're spending so much on education within education they spend so much on primary or on secondary education and then uh, next to it unrelated to it and of course you need to relate it is uh, we will have programs huh? and programs can span multiple organizations or you know we can have programs uh, that are um, you know we can can have a constraint say you know one organization uh, a program uh, um, should be under one organization only, but but that's not preferred because programs should be interorganizational. And then you will have the the, the COFAL classification next to it as an international classification. Uh, within a program, you have projects. Within a project, you have activity. Um, and etc. I'm not going to go, uh, and then you know we need to know where the funds come from. Uh, we have donors, uh, we have our own funds, tax funds, so we have fund types, um, uh, the location, uh, uh, in which province, in which municipality, or which district. Uh, this is actually the chart of accounts of Afghanistan. And then we have an economic classification. What type of cost? Is it spent on uh, wages, salaries, or uh, you know services, or um, goods? with uh, major codes, minor codes. And, um, you know, through the budget cycle, uh, you, you go through appropriation. So you pre present a budget, which is um, classified in all these classifications. So you have like a, a, a code string or a chart string, uh, that would be called in a private sector organization, which consists of a multiple codes um, that are sort of glued together and say like, okay, uh, this amount is going to go to that organization for this program. And it comes from that fund. And, uh, you know, it will be spent in that province and the type of spending and the type of budget is, uh, you know, it's, it's for wages or it's for services. So at level of appropriation, you see that, uh, you know, we'll do that at higher level, uh, these green blocks. Mm. And then, you know, once the budget is approved by parliament, by the uh, legislative um, authority or power in a the country, then, um, you know, it needs to get allotted uh, uh, from an organization. Uh, it needs to go to... Um, you know, an organizational unit, you get so much. Uh, the money that is allotted over a project needs to go to an activity. And then you will have, uh, you know, commitments that are taken in budget execution. Uh, we, um, we we set aside, uh, make a reservation on the budget because we're going to spend it. And then a transaction, the actual uh, purchase. Um, so that goes then through a public procurement. But if you're not aware of, you know, how your chart of accounts really looks like, and if you're thinking of changing it or it's kind of blurry, across uh, various units um, and the Ministry of Finance is not capable of sort of um, you know instructing departments very clearly to use uh, that that chart of accounts as this multi-tiered data structure to you know budget and uh, and report uh, their expenditure against that then uh, it's going to be very difficult and uh, you know it all translates into um, a budget this is something I think I made for um, Nepal, uh, this is just, uh, you know, how a program classification translates, yes, yeah, for Nepal. 
they see the red book that's the official budget um you know program has activities and and so you'll have sort of a joint table program activity which combines a program and activity so that's sort of a relational database design uh, with one to uh, many relations um where you need to break up uh, many to many relationships uh, and uh, so you'll have a lot of code tables also uh, source code uh, modalities um and um you know yeah it becomes a uh difficult uh, i made this actually to show to nepal that we would probably be better off with buying an off-the-shelf uh pfm system like you know free balance or um they, they liked oracle uh, something like jd edwards or um, uh, rather than you know building uh, things from scratch for these things you have uh standard solutions available uh, yes they are expensive and yes, they come with a lot of consultancy. And yes, it takes a lot of time to implement them. But I would tell them in Belgium, we had the same thing. You know, we're running basically SAP, uh, which is called FedCom in Belgium. And it took 10 years, you know, to really implement it. Uh, you know, um, there was a firm commitment from the administration. Yes, we need a sort of, a, I would say, a financial or administrative um, uh, ERP system. And, uh, you know, despite all institutional complexity in Belgium, uh, this system keeps the country together, I would say, and makes it possible to present unified budgets and also report against, uh, you know, the budget structures um, uh, that we see here. Um, so that's to... Um, uh yeah i was going into the weeds let's get back to the main thing when you talk about uh you know um, ict management uh, improving your processes or thinking about your portfolio of ict projects uh, both uh, projects that relate to what, what you call your legacy but i said don't think about your legacy negatively ah, it works uh, maybe you know a minor um, uh, technology upgrade will will make your stuff better. Maybe you can um, build an app on top of your um, a backend that uh, as I said users want apps and they want it fast. And um, you know I looked a bit at it. I'm not an expert in it, but um, both Google um, Google Play Store and and Microsoft Store. Um, you know, they come with a whole environment uh, to, you know, develop it. And, you know, your, your applications uh, build a build something, um, a front end on top that is cross-platform that runs on Android or um, iOS phones, smartphones. So um, I looked a bit at um, Xamarin.forms. Um, well, it's like Microsoft Forms. Very nice. Uh, and it's a development um, environment that relies on you know the the software development kits uh from apple and google itself to target yeah android uh, or an ios uh, platform devices so the you can use the same languages for the logic that's behind c sharp um it all gets connected by uh, i would say this is the nice thing uh the html or xml uh the the the, the forms that uh, a user will will download uh, uh with the mark extensible markup language um so in .NET it's called uh, xaml uh, extensible application markup language but for the rest there's not too many changes that you need to make um to um, you know build apps on top of a classical uh, i would say .NET architecture um uh, yeah, I mentioned a few other things here that come with uh, .NET 8. Um, yeah, user wants speed and security. Uh, uh, well, again, there I repeat, you do not necessarily get better speed by merely just, you know, repackaging your applications or rewriting them on, on a low-code platform because you think, well, this is a bit of a, a PHP application, but we know we don't have the original developer anymore. Um, it would take us a while to re-engineer the source code, etc., uh, etc. Et well, don't, if you rewriting an application from from scratch to replace an older application well um, it's not necessarily gonna work better so really think of uh, when you when you do take that decision of making sufficient analysis of uh, the older application how it worked how it was factored uh, I would say and and yes uh, if you go to a new platform use the most ad advanced features of it that do promise uh, to uh, to make things work better like uh, you know concurrency indeed uh, or in a my microservice architecture um, you know refactor your applications so uh, they're, they're easier to manage you'll have more uh, more moving parts but they need to work all together um, security as said for me it implies really respect for standards and uh, would be bold multi-factor authentication you know not easy to implement network segmentation or segregation 
Um, and yeah, I've been there, managed and, and properly supported development frameworks, monitoring, and uh, and that's it. So um, I think I'm at the end of my um, of my presentation. And uh, yeah, thanks. I'll uh, listen to it and see uh, how much I rambled.